Was there, was there, was there, was empires in Africa called Kush Timbuktu, where every race came to get books With my success to you, even if you wish me the opposite Sooner or later, we'll all see who the prophet is Unity, our um, constitution, the way we operate is based basically on um, Malcolm X's organization of African American unity. Yeah. It has the same exact principles, building a mass network of African people so we can um, govern our community, be accountable to the people in there, and govern our own movements. Yeah, we're an independent organization so that we can address issues that are important to us. So for example, if we were funded by the National Lottery, maybe today we couldn't have this um, conference. We'd have to tone it down. We can't use black. We can't use, well, we can't, you know, there's a certain people we have to say. They probably want to, want to see our itinerary. Probably want to see who you got lecturing. And we ain't into that. We ain't into that. So we know what we need. We know what we need to talk about. We know the language that we use. We know the trauma that we're going through. We know that we're living in a system of white supremacy. And we need a safe space to be able to articulate that. So that is what OBU is trying to provide for you. Of the many projects that OBU has their hands in right now, one of the main projects under our education department is the reopening of the Marcus Garvey Nursery, which is on Lingwood Road in Hansworth, for anybody from um, Birmingham. So there's a nursery on Lingwood Road. It was the first black nursery in the West Midlands. And for various reasons, it's closed. So OBU, along with the community, we have, you know, we have a mission to reopen this um, nursery. Now the way that we're doing it, so that it's community governance and control, we are selling shares. Yeah, we're selling the shares at 50 pound each. So as a shareholder, you have an ability, you know, you have, you're in a position to say what goes on there, right? You have the right to have your voice heard. If you um, think that something's going on, you don't agree with it, you have a responsibility, you know, you have, you're in the position to be able to articulate that. Okay, so we're selling shares for £50 each. This £50, what does it get you? It gets you part, you build a part of your community. You're involved in something, you are part of something that is helping to build the youth, um, build the future for our youth. So one of the things that we have for sale, that we've produced, is a booklet that is called Power of the Movement, Pioneers of the Fight. Now, what tends to happen, and I'm going to touch on this in my presentation later, when we hear about our history, we hear about the same ones, shackles and chains and all this, we never hear about the ones that were instrumental in fighting colonialism, channel, um, killing the colonialists. Okay, there's people in here that we may have never heard of. For example, Zumbi. Anybody heard of Zumbi? Yeah. Bookman Dotty, who knows who Bookman Dotty is? Yeah. Yeah. See, everybody should be saying yeah, because I said Mary Seacole, if I said Martin Luther King, everybody would be up. Oh, why don't we know about Bookman Dotty? Why don't we know about Nanny the Maroons? Why don't we know about Queen and Zinga? Why don't we know about Sister Nahanda? Why? Because these were the people that were instrumental in starting revolutions, kicking out white boys, starting all kind of things. But they don't want to know that in school. All they want to know is you were slaves, you were this and you were that. They don't talk about the other side of it. So we have purposely produced a book that only has people that were instrumental in challenging colonialism. By no means are we saying this to everybody. Not at all. This is a handful of people that we've picked. Yeah, and it's a little introduction, so it's good for children. It's good for yourself as an adult if you think, oh, I didn't really know that. If you know the stuff in here already, buy it for somebody who don't know. Kwanzaa present, birthday present, Happy Monday, any reason, they're two pounds, and your two pounds is going to go into the reopening of Marcus Garvey Nursery. So even if you can't afford the 50 pound right now, right, at least you know your two pound contribution is directly going into reopening the Marcus Garvey Nursery. There'll be no change, we'll stay enslaved until we fight the, fight the system and its ways. Don't be afraid, just be the change. And with all this people power, we'll use peace for power. Video. 
that is actually on our research. And I want you to, I'm going to pause it at a particular point, which I've done before the people who've seen me um, play this video. So. This is an old one, so some of the young people might not be familiar with it. Show my age now. Okay, so a lot of people are uncomfortable there. Why? Why are we uncomfortable during that? <coughs> but first thing, going back to the beats, right? So, so the beats of these songs are, as people say, hard. Yeah. Um, anyone who has have two cents in their head knows how African people respond to music. So in terms of who this is serving, this is serving the interests of people who, in a sense, are still treating black people as they were in slavery times. But what a lot of people don't know is that a lot of these huge musical corporations also own the prison industrial complex. So they are pushing this music. And the young man up there spoke about, you know, if you have a sense of self, then, you know, um, these things won't affect you. That is not true at all. Um, anyone who, who's interested, have a look at metaphysics. There's a lot of study that's gone into how African people respond to music. Second thing is, a lot of us don't actually know what our cultural dances and backgrounds are because our history's been stolen from us. So what's happened is, our own culture is being sold and packaged back to us in a form of prostitution. trying to find our roots and, and that's wherever we are um, in the world and have a higher consciousness and understand that the reason why we respond so well and the reason why um, the musical industry pushes this stuff to us is because it's literally like drugs to us. We are addicted to our own culture and spirit which comes through music, rhythm and dance. I can also add on to that point, but also when, when there is a celebration, when there is kind of women dancing and kind of not necessarily, or not always gyrating, but moving their bodies in certain ways. That is also demonised. That is also being told, well, you know what? That's too sexualised. To you know, and I think there are, and this is why I show these videos because there are massive contradictions within when we're looking at music videos. I believe that music videos do have impact, especially in terms of. And I'm not gonna. Um, I can take one, two, yeah. There's a guy in the mic. <laughs> um, Someone with a mic at the top, yeah. yeah. Hello. Okay, okay, hold on, hold on, you're pushing, haven't you? Hello. Um, why do you think I've stopped this music video at this particular point? Has anybody picked up on anything from it? What, what, is, what about the lady in the background? She's white. Do we see her budget? We don't. We see... This video is showing the black woman, and I say the darker skin, if you know, if we go into issues of colorism, show her body. She's the one who's the, the object of, um, um, she's, oh, I'd say, almost commodified and sectionized. Whereas this, this woman here, she's deemed to be more beautiful, and, and you never see her body. Okay? And this is what I talk about the contradictions within it. Okay? Does, does someone have a, did you have a point? And then we've got it. Um. I'm sorry, my accent is not that smooth like everyone in here. Yeah? But, um, but I think the problem I see is black people, we don't control what we you know, put out and what we consume. You understand? Someone else controls our music, someone else controls our distributions. Look at every other race, they control their music. Look at the Asians, they control what the music they consume. And I think the problem is, if we don't con um, control what we put out, it's still going to be a problem. So I think we just need to like control the music we make. So, Thank you. I think what it is, and it's really important to this is not a clear cut answer. A lot of people think that if you kind of call out a particular black musical, it's not me, is it? <laughs> you call it a lot of black 
musical dramas, then you blame me. And I'm in agreement with you that it's kind of playing black men and black women off against each other. And I think that that is um, something that I've come across from a personal um, journey to say, well, hold on, it's black men, but black men do not own the music that they're producing. Get it? So I think we need to be we need to be aware not just of the end product. We need to you know go back even further and do our research, going back to what Martin's going to talk about around kind of self education. <laughs> Um, just for those who says Dr. Martin Green, you just call me Dr. Martin, that's so, all. You see me in the break, call me that. Um, I'm 58 this year, three kids, five grandkids. My, my daughter's 40th birthday this year, and she's having a 70th birthday party, and she's saying, Dad, come, I don't want to, I hate it the way we dressed in the 70s. So all of you young people think it's retro. <laughs> but the relevance of it, I was a father at 16. I was terrible. 40 odd years later, I get a PhD. In 1984, I went to Boston and I met people at New Malcolm X. I went to where he used to live. I spent 20 years researching him. Before I start my own presentation about self education, I want to kind of put the record straight. For 35 years, I've been working in prisons. Still do. I work with the hardcore. I work with man's like Little Wayne when they go to prison. The relevance of it is, we always talk about the ones that are not doing good. I can take some kind of comfort in a lot of the man's that I've worked with who've been to prison, who are now at university, who are now running their own companies. So the things that I learned from Malcolm X, when Malcolm X got a sentence, he read the dictionary. That's why he was very articulate. So one thing I want to kind of challenge, and really, I'm a criminologist. And even though I'm involved in crime, say crime doesn't pay, well, I get paid for being a criminologist, so I suppose it does. If you've got a notepad, if you've got a phone, because I'm going to give you a kind of template for those of you, because one of the things that Dion said, I want to pick up on. If you don't own the means of production and distribution of your ideas, you're controlled. And what I'm going to address is practically how you have to get to do this. So this is my strategy. Read. Everyone says, what do you want to read? I've got 3,000 books. I've been collecting books from my 16 years of age. Read the Bible, read the Quran, read anything, but read. Because when you get to court and you can't read, you're going to get a longer sentence because you can't sign a statement. Reading is not just about pleasure, reading is the language of power. And if you don't have the language of power, you're going to get controlled. But you two have developed a new term that I've heard, never heard it when I was growing up. The term long ting. <laughs> Here's a book. Oh, it's a long ting, man. It's Twitter. Yeah, I'm cool with 135 characters. Well, unfortunately, when you get charged with an offence, it's a big statement. So, first thing I want to say, right, read. Why is it important to read? Because anybody here runs projects, and I know quite a few of you run projects, we are now in a culture of evidence-based practice. And if you don't understand theories and frameworks, you ain't getting funded. There's three types of broke. White people, broke. You know what it's like? You, got, you, need, you need 30 pounds, you've got 25. So you say, can you lend me a fiver? I'm broke. Black people, if you need 25 and you've only got five, you're broke. But if you're really broke, it's just K. And for a lot of us, reading will solve some of your problems. But well, what happens is, you consume everybody else's work. I, wrote, I write my own books. I write children's books. I write speeches for other people. So, the first thing I want to say is, read. Nothing's worse than ignorance. I've studied Malcolm X for 20 years. One person I've studied for 20 years. Why? Because when anybody wanted to say something, I wanted to challenge what they say in an informed way. But a lot of us, we're reactive. Everybody, I, I mean, there's some black people who blame white people for everything. If, like, if the electricity gets cut off and you haven't paid the bill, it's like, wait, it's white people stay. It's white people, I'm telling you that. No, it's not. You need to pay your bill. <laughs> man goes to Kentucky and he says, yo, he's in Greece on this food, man. He's going to kill me one day. Well, don't go to Kentucky then. Read. Ignorance is not bliss, but some of us make an occupation out of ignorance. Read. Are we agreed on that? Yes. Don't lie to me. Yes. 
become a builder of ideas. I know Mario can build a great split. <laughs> I was at Notting Hill Parliament one day, a guy called to me and said, Yo, Martin, it's all this Rizzler. I've never smoked weed in my life. Anyway, he, he put like 10 Rizzler on my hand. And he put like 15, 20 pounds worth of weed on this thing. And the wind changed direction. Mm. And the whole weed, I saw it, slow motion, the weed just went. <laughs> and he, and he did, you know, he's got that look, he said, Yo, but. I said, Bridget, it's the wind, don't blame me. <laughs> weeks ago, about, about a month ago in prison, a man comes up to me, got a 15 year sentence. And he said, yo, mine, I used, to, I, I used to be a robber. Now, you know when someone goes up and says, yeah, I used to be a robber, you know, I used to rob banks. And I said to him, be any good? And he said, well, yeah, yeah. I said, no, you got 15 years. You should have carried on playing Grand Theft Auto. It would have been a cheaper way to do it. But the fact of the matter is, spoke to him, tell me about your first few years. Kicked out of primary school, kicked out of secondary school, kicked, kicked. So the only way you could build ideas is on the streets. Expert drug dealer. But I said, have you ever tried to inform the drugs and the chemical industry about drugs and the harmful effects and work for the NHS? No. So as much as he was a gangster, he had great knowledge, but he didn't have no common sense because sense in his case was never common. So the reality of it is, when you're building ideas, you know what thing I love about kids? They've got the great ideas. Have you ever noticed with us? If I said to some of you, I want to draw a picture of you, unless it looks like a photograph, you can say, that's not looks like me. When a child, you say to a child, draw a picture of me, they do the little stick person in the middle of the piece of paper. And you go, that's not me, but to a child, that is. So I would say, for those of you over a certain age, build your ideas the way children do. Free from, just let your imagination run wild. Don't put no limits on your thinking. So become a builder of ideas. And if you notice, there's three people in there, so don't build your ideas. They never built the pyramids on their own. I'm a small guy, so if I was in Egypt, I'd be giving the orders, because there's no way I'm picking up a big rock like that. I couldn't do it. But together, we build. And that's what Malcolm talks about. Hi, you're watching Got Good TV. We're here at Birmingham City University for the Malcolm X Conference. Um, we're on a break right now. And we have some stores inside. Do you want to come and take a look? <laughs> look at all these social boundaries. Look at all these broken families. Nobody is speaking freely. Yeah. Wrapped up on the false pretenses. Trying to match his expectations. How have you found the day so far? It's been a very interesting day. I think um, it's always good to be in that environment where there's a positive discussion and debate. Yeah, and um, that's what this has facilitated. So that's always a good thing. Right? So, young people, raise your hands. Okay. And all I want you to do, keep hands up. <laughs> <laughs> Just say four words. I am Malcolm X. 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 Everyone stand up, man. Stand up. Okay, okay. Let's start that again. Right hand up. I am Malcolm X. I am Malcolm X. I am Malcolm X. Thank you, I'm at a youth conference, finally. Let's go. My message is gonna be short, sweet, straight to the point. Dr. Martin Glynn, my sister Dion, I've already said everything that I've needed to say. So I'm just really gonna make my message short and sweet, and it's really for everybody in these first five roles. Now I love Malcolm X. <coughs> absolutely love Malcolm X because he was a mentor that I never met and anybody in this room right now that hasn't picked up his autobiography tell your parents today go and buy it <laughs> order it at eight pound I looked this morning seven pound four pound second hand get the book 
And when you read it, you'll start to understand the mind of an individual. So some of the information that I'm going to talk to you today is really just to kind of share the mind of an individual, but bring it into Birmingham 2015. As you see the quote, education is the passport to the future, for tomorrow belongs to those who prepare for it today. So today we're preparing, we're in preparation mode. So let's go. You know when you hear people say that there's two paths in life? I actually critique that. One of my mentors at the back, Raymond Douglas, to show your hand. It's a conversation, and I'm sure all of you will be very familiar with this, that there's a competition somehow going on in our community. Everybody's competing with something. Everybody's competing. I want you young people to learn from the mistakes of people that are behind you. Learn from the mistakes and listen to the mistakes. There's the talk that there is some sort of competition going on in our communities. Everybody's running for some sort of money. Everybody wants some sort of status. Everybody wants to be respected by any means necessary, etc., etc., etc. Raymond Douglas taught me many years ago, don't worry about those two paths. Create your own lane and just keep driving. Did you get that? Don't worry about the two paths. Create your own lane and keep driving. So what does that mean? So regardless of the haters, regardless of the people bickering and arguing, you do you. That's what it means. You do you. So maybe not everybody's interested in what you're talking about. You do you. Because you know what? You might be in a situation where you've got another hundred young people in the building and you have the opportunity to also give them an idea. So don't worry about what the next man or the next woman says about what it is that you're doing. Create your lane and just keep driving. Just keep driving. And there's times you're gonna mess up. There's times that you're gonna make mistakes. And the only advice I would give is get strong mentors around you, people that know. People that possibly have made mistakes. Doesn't have to necessarily be in the world that you're trying to go down but they have life experience, some of the oldest that are in the room, use them. Create your own lane and keep driving. Forget about the paths. People talk about think outside the box, just stay outside the box, stay outside of it. You heard me say already, I work with a lot of violent young people. When I'm talking about violent young people, I'm talking about young people that I would be very weary to even bring them into this type of space. Because the amount of people that are in the room, it would make them paranoid. So paranoid as such, regardless of the children in the room, they would want to carry a fire around with them. They're the types of young people, and we're dealing with mindsets. That's all the battle is right now to the oldest in the room. We're battling with mindsets. So even though we was talking earlier about music and we was talking about things, that's the world that they live in. They want to talk about niggas and bitches and hoes. We don't like it. Let's be real, we don't like it. And we don't want it. But that's the world that they're listening to. So we need to find a way to engage. Because if we don't engage, what they'll do is they'll inspire these lot. So we don't, who cares about little Wayne? It becomes the man in Hansworth, the man in Aston, the man in Neutrals, the man in Mosley, wherever they are. They become the individuals that inspire these lot. So that's why I changed the dynamic for them to hear and for you to hear what's going on with these lot. That's the world that they're in. So engage it, don't ignore it, don't point the finger. Create your own road and drive. All right. Education is your most powerful weapon. Education is your most powerful weapon. Because no one can't take back your chat. Education is your most powerful weapon. We've all seen guns, why not everybody? Some people have, I've seen it. Seen knives, I've seen people hurt people. But ain't nothing more powerful than that. Ain't nothing more powerful than that. Because that can take you global. And I'm blessed to have the opportunity to be able to travel from country to country every couple of months because of that. And guess how long it took me? Guess how long it took me? Guess, just guess how long it took me. From the point when they told me that I was going to go to prison mm -hmm. and I had no GCSEs, guess how long it took me? Five years. Five years, brilliant. Five years? How long time, really? No, it's not. Five years. Last sleep. I was tired. <laughs> I'd go to work. Come on. 
go to the library for days. Do you remember them days? You remember, don't you? Stress, felt like crying. But you know what? It's five years and it worked out. I don't pay to go nowhere across the globe, and I'm not saying that to, to, to boost myself up. I don't pay to go anywhere across the world. All I need is my passport and my mouth. That's all I need. That's all I need. So what I'm saying to you young people is education is your most powerful weapon, and don't let no one take that from you. So whether you acquire that in school, whether you acquire that in your household, whether you acquire that in yourself by studying certain types of books and acquiring knowledge, but ask questions. Because book all books can't give you answers until you're asking, you're challenging, you critique. Because yes. some people sit at books and think, yeah, I'm just going to read, I'm going to read, I'm going to read, and get that knowledge. Yeah. But books can't talk back. <laughs> and the person that wrote the book may have interpreted something in one way, you might interpret another way. And that's the thing about books. My um, presentation is called Blonde Hair, Blue Eyes, Black Girl. Okay? Now, before I explain the title, I just want to show you a picture. Yeah? <laughs> Guess who this is, right? This is about 20 years ago. This is Kush Datum in the early days, right? So, this is, this is what our presentation is about. This is me as a probably 13, 14 year old girl here. And I look at this picture and I think to myself, what was going through my head? What was. Not just because of the way, you know, I was, I was looking, but like, what was my influences? Who was I modeling myself against? Who, what was my point of reference when I was getting up in the morning and getting myself ready, when I was going to buy clothes and all those kind of things? What look was I going for? Who was I trying to copy? You understand what I mean? So another reason why I put this picture up is to show that I wasn't born with luck. I wasn't born black power. I too have gone through my stages. You understand? So I'm talking from a balanced perspective. Yeah? If not, my dad was a rasta, don't get me wrong, I still have my days, because that's not my hair. <laughs> you understand what I mean? So I still had to go through my changes as well. So I'm not standing here from, as a, from a, um, a point of like, um, you know, I'm not trying to. Yeah, I'm not up here like. Um, Preaching. Preaching or anything like that. What I'm trying to show is that I'm coming from a balanced perspective. And I haven't always looked like this. So I was, I'm, I was trying to understand my own journey. Okay? Mm -hmm. So. Oh, I'm sorry. Who got it? Children prefer the white dog. In Brown versus 
Okay, I hope you were all distressed watching that because I was very distressed. You can see the anguish in the little girl when she was asked which doll looks like you. After she identified the doll as being ugly, bad, and all these kind of things. And then she was asked which one looks like you. You see the look in her face. Yeah. Every time I watch it, I get these. Yeah. Them goose people, yeah. That, that's horrible to watch. And I've watched it loads of times. Yeah, but we have to ask ourselves why. We have to ask ourselves why she identifies that as being the ugly doll, the bad, the, um, the black, the bad doll. Okay, so we know that the media has a big influence over, you know, we've been having that message all day, how the, inf uh, the media has a big influence over what we think, yeah, whether it's um, consciously or unconsciously. So who believes? Princesses. So what? No, no, I and I pick me princess. Ain't no princess with an afro. Princess don't have locks. Right? These are the images that young children are seeing, our young girls are watching. It's on Nickelodeon, CBBS, Disney, all those cartoons. Yeah, the images that we have in our house, the images that we wear on our shirts, the videos they see, the TV programs that they see. This is what this is what um, is reinforced to them. So by, by the time a child is four or five, they already have the concept of black being bad and white being good. And that's a problem to me personally. I don't know about you guys. That's a problem to me. Okay, my second set of findings was that notions of beauty are inherited from other women in the family and I've done so from a very early age. So what that means is there's little girls around you right now that's looking at, oh, she doesn't hair like this. I don't do my hair like that. Oh, she wears her skirt like this. I'm not wearing my skirt like that, right? She adores herself like this. I'm gonna adore myself like that. So we, whether we know or not, like Craig was saying, there's people watching you. You are being an example to somebody, whether you know it or not. So these little four and five year olds, they hear your conversations, they hear how you talk about yourself, right? They hear you tell them, oh, um, your hair is beautiful, but you've got your artificial hair in. Mm -hmm. Right? Like the first one said, she will learn the ways of a goddess because I'll be her first and best example. That's her mother. Mm -hmm. Right? Children are great imitators. So give them something great to imitate. Look how beautiful the princess looks. Mama taught me ain't nothing wrong with my natural fro. <laughs> right? <laughs> so these are the things. Um, working in like youth work and the play work industry, there is a saying that says, um, there is um, there's, there's things that are more caught than taught, okay? So even if you're not sitting down, teaching a child something, they're picking up on the subtle nuances, they're listening to your conversations and they're hearing what you're doing every day. Okay, here are some more other slides from my findings. Um, just like, we all know the story with the, um, on this plantation, the dark skinned ones outside, picking the cotton, doing all this, and the light skinned ones in the house, got the waistcoat, got the, you know, the pot button water, got the bonnet rice, all those things, right? And that is what's perpetuated in the media. So the idea is, what they make you believe is that the lighter you are, yeah, that is related to upward social mobility. So the lighter you are, you're gonna get the man. See, if you ain't you ain't getting no man, you know. <laughs> That's what they tell me. If I don't look like, if I'm not a light-skinned woman, right, if, I, if my body don't look a certain way, if my hair don't look a certain way, I just ain't getting no man. Probably why I ain't got no man now, I don't like that. <laughs> but on the contrary, darker skin is still associated with cotton picking. Now people might not say that, but it's not, that's not the only attitude in this country. If you look at in India, you have what we call the untouchables. Yes. Those are the darkest people of that nation. Yeah, so in every nation we have this colorism, this caste system. Yeah, and in all and all in all of these systems, it is the lighter you are, way, way up there, and see if it's dark. Not a thing. Right? Even if you look at some of the TV programs that we watch, look at someone like EastEnders. Right? And I always use this because if you look at the two sisters, Kim and Denise, they're both dark skinned, don't get me wrong. But look at look at look at how Kim looks. You know, because she kind of tick with it, yeah? Mm -hmm. And look how they, look how they, look how they um, perpetuate her. She's always all decent. She can't get out, man. And then you got nice, neat Denise, you know. <laughs> so, so, you understand what I mean? She has the trauma, she has the tragedies as well. But they portray, portray them in two different ways. Mm -hmm. And that is purposeful. That's purposeful.
How has it been today for you so far? Kind of, I've uh, just started, but well, good. <laughs> well, quite good. Yeah, quite good. Okay. Um, any bestseller today? Or any certain item that people are taking more in? Oh, head wraps. <laughs> That's what we sell more, yeah, head wraps. Um, girls, men's, for the missus. Yeah. So you ask what BFBP stands for. Officially, it stands for Black Foundation, Black Platform. BFBP is a multimedia platform which shares documentaries, as you, as you saw above, music videos, and we're, we're also writing movies. All of these different compartments that we, that we deal with deal with positive images and information of our people. Now that might sound like something simple, yeah? But it's not as simple as it sounds. Because there was a Chinese man who used to sit in Marcus Garvey's lecture. Listen to me closely, my people. Because this is one of the most pungent pieces of information I'm going to deliver on this floor today. There was a Chinese man. I can't remember his name. I know I've got a... What's his name? Mao Zedong. Mao Zedong. Do the research. Yeah? And he used to sit in Marcus Garvey's lectures. And we know that loads of people learn from Marcus Garvey. Uh, Elijah Muhammad. Malcolm X's dad. There's not really anyone that came after Marcus Garvey that can't give some credit to Marcus Garvey for where they reached when Marcus Garvey done the real thing with a seventh with a seventh grade education. Yeah, so when you hear a man here like Marcus Garvey, he organized over six million black people with a seventh eight education. Great Come on, great greatest black man that, that, that lived. That's, that's what I'm that's what I'm saying, right? Well, in this generation, he's the greatest black man that lived just by his words. Because Garvey still lives through the fact that we're still here and going on. So basically, you have, um, I'm going to start with this. This is BFBP. This is my big bro. In the past, the greatest weapon the white man has had has been his ability to divide and conquer. If I take my hand and slap you, you don't even see it. It might sting you because these dishes are separated. But all I have to do to put you back in your place is bring those digits together. Yeah. So that's basically the solidarity. Yeah. So, 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 Ma yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. So, Malcolm, so Malcolm X basically showed you that our solidarity is going to be our strength. And they tried to divide Malcolm X and Martin Luther King, but most people don't know. By the time the brothers died, they were saying nearly the same thing. Because it was Martin Luther King that didn't only make the statement about integration, but he also said, those who make peaceful revolution impossible, make violent revolution inevitable. Yeah, and we have to come to terms with this and understand that when the youth hit the streets and riot, it's something that needs to be done. Yeah, I'm not saying that we should go out and riot. make a statement like that is because justice is what stops the next officer from shooting down a black youth yeah and so justice would be the officers being punished but that doesn't happen so what stops an officer from shooting down the next black youth it should be the response of the black community our political response but they care not for our peaceful protests so what stops an officer from shooting a black youth the fear of the whole place burning down. Mm -hmm. That is the, just that, that's just the honest truth. I'm just a realist. True. I'm a realist. So I'm so real that I understand that. Mm -hmm. And he understands that better than us. That's why when David Cameron came and said, all oh, these people are the rights, I know he went back to the Metropolitan Police and told them, you better fix up your act. Mm -hmm. And I know this from the reaction to the police with us mm -hmm. after the riots. They gave all the big talk on the TV, but they wasn't looking at us in our eyes on the roads. Mm -hmm. And this is real life. I'm not lying, this is my experiences. No officer, about for at least a week after the riots, wanted to look me in my eyes. Mm -hmm. So I realised that they know that the pressure's being put in them. The riots didn't just stop in London. It reached Birmingham. It reached Manchester. Ah, uh, nothing them it reach. You see, so we know that the that the um, that our people are still connected, but our people are we, we act together. Yeah. You know, we act out of impulsion, but we need to have the political base to organise on a on a more powerful element. So we don't need to burn that down. 
Just 200 black men just need to march to the police station where it happens, stay silent for an hour and walk away. Yeah. Yeah. And I promise you, they'll start acting different. Yeah. There, there, there's powers, there's powers to be done by solidarity and us organising and mobilising. Now, true say time's running out, and I've got, um, and I'm going to give you guys a little something to leave with. I'm going to just flow quickly through some of the pointers that I had, yeah? So, one of the main pointers that I wanted to leave with you today is a quote from a woman by the name of Margaret Sanger. She was the head of Planned Parenthood, which is, a, which is the main abortion uh, clinics in America. And she made a statement that said, colored people are like human weeds to be exterminated. Now, if I'm a liar, do the research and call me out to be a liar. Margaret Sanger, yeah? The, the one of the founders of Plant Par Planned Parenthood said, we do not want it to go out that we want to exterminate the Negro population. When they set up these abortion clinics, they specifically set them up in black areas. Yeah? Now this is all stuff. I'm not a liar. If I'm a liar, someone call me out to be a liar. This is facts. This, this is the leader of Planned Parenthood speaking. Then let's hear from the from, from, from Abraham Lincoln, good old Abraham Lincoln who freed the slaves. I will say that I am not, nor ever have been in favor of bringing about any way the social and political equality of white and black races. This is what Abraham Lincoln said. The reason they stopped slavery was because if they didn't stop it, the South would have had a lot more money and been able to take over them. So it was an economical thought, them thinking about themselves. England only stopped slavery after the Haiti Revolution. You didn't know that. When they saw Haiti and they said in France and they said in the next one and the next one and none of them could have touched Haiti, a year later, the House of Commons voted to stop slavery. So we know that that vote was based upon their understanding that we could successfully revolt. Mm -hmm. these, these, these things are so um, detrimental because we have to understand that we have made, when they say we're making progress, we made no progress. We've fought and we've got to where we're going to. Yeah. That's us. Nothing upon the white man. White man's never done anything, never given us anything. Yeah. You know, Ma Malcolm X said, you don't stick a knife six inches into a, nine inches into a man's back Pull it out six inches and call it progress. Yeah. You don't need 